Hey guys, how's it going? Derek Craig here with another oldfootbasics.com Discover podcast. This is episode number 66, and today we're going to be talking about frac sand and commodity trading. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about a handful of different topics here today. Uh, I've got Alex Maleshko here with on the on Zoom here with me, and we'll get him on here in just a second. We're going to be talking about not only like types of sand, but also um, what the sand market is like, and a little bit about the history, just kind of going full circle on sand. Uh, so if you don't know much about sand, get ready. You're going to learn about it today. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a lot to cover and uh, pretty excited to dive into this. But we're also going to go a little bit beyond even just um, the basics of sand and also talk about uh, specifically how it's traded, which is interesting because I didn't even know that sand was traded like a commodity, but it makes sense that it is. So y'all will be learning just along with me. I'm uh, pretty excited to, to dive into this to, into this topic. Before we get there, though, just a quick couple announcements and then we'll, we'll get going on this. But first off, just wanted to say that um, by the time this episode is released, uh, we will have interns onboarded so we will have easily more than doubled um, if not tripled the, the size of our team so we're really looking forward to an exciting summer uh, of, of really expanding our, our content and really helping to uh, get everybody who has reached out to us who wants to to work with us really helping to have more uh, hands <laughs> to send your way to, to help and, and to, to, to get to capture this content and to work with you guys on this so if you've reached out in the past and you know you've got some sluggish responses hopefully that'll pick up here real soon we definitely got a little army coming at you and uh, really look forward to what we can tackle here this summer and uh, really grow our platform. And also along those lines too, if you've been thinking about reaching out and wanting to get on the podcast or wanting to do a course with us, um, now is definitely the time. Uh, definitely encourage you to reach out. Uh, you can contact us at contact at ofobasics.com. That's by email. Or otherwise, you can find me on LinkedIn or uh, snail mail. I don't know, track me down somehow. So uh, definitely reach out if you're interested. Uh, we'll definitely uh, facilitate that and get you on. Like I said, today we're going to be talking about frac sand and commodity trading. And now I've got Alex Maleshko on the f on Zoom. I keep wanting to say on the phone. Uh, we're getting used to this new Zoom option. So <laughs> welcome to Zoom, Alex. How you doing? Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks again for having me, Derek. Really appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. So Alex is the manager of, of Frac Sand for a company called Pan Exchange here out of Denver. So he's a local to me. Like I said, excited to have you on today. I'd love to learn a little bit more about uh, your background and what you do for for Pan Exchange. Yeah. So I mean, my background. I'm a petroleum engineer by schooling. Um, I graduated from Montana Tech. And yeah, like you mentioned, I'm, I'm currently the manager of Frac Sand at Pan Exchange. Um, so kind of a bit about us. We're an online trading platform where we trade commodities that are a little bit more low key. We call them nascent. Um, so what that means really is, is they're commodities that they're in are in their budding stages. So not something like crude oil, for example, that obviously has a large medium of exchange to trade, but something, you know, like frac sand, like, as you mentioned earlier, is a little bit, you know, more on, on the down low that, you know, people might not necessarily view as a commodity. Right. <laughs> um, and then we also actually have, um, we actually publish based on the data that we get um, index prices. So think like WTI, um, but for sand that you could hedge <laughs> against or you could um, do things like that. And then so prior to that role, um, I worked for the better part of a year at a company called um, RS Energy Group, um, which was owned by a large, uh, you know, private equity fund, uh, Warburg Pincus at the time. And uh, I was in a role supporting buy side equity research. Um, so I have some exposure to um, capital markets and um, to trading as well, even though I come from an engineering background. So, um, yeah, a bit of a bit of a catch all, <laughs> I guess you could say. Is, is yeah, no, that's definitely a, a pretty interesting background. And so w first off, what's uh, what's Montana's tech's uh, mascot? I don't even you don't hear too many people from Montana tech. I don't yeah, know, two up north yeah. or something. So our, our, our mascot <laughs> is. Uh, we're, we're the ore diggers, but our, our mascot is Charlie Ore Digger. <laughs> Charlie the Ore Digger. <laughs> yeah, Charlie Ore Digger. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I definitely have a, a few picks with him. So there you go. Uh, I'd have to send them over on. Yeah. yeah, you can just have them in the background of your, your profile pic. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I was yeah. just curious. Uh, definitely, uh, no handful of people out of Montana Tech, but uh, uh, definitely not not a, a whole bunch. So I was curious to to know a little bit more about that. But tell me a little bit about uh, tell me a little bit about what got you into. Uh, the sand specifically, like, like, was this something? Did you just have an interest in this in school, or I guess kind of how how did the path take you uh, to work with Pan Exchange on uh, frac sand? Yeah, so it was kind of interesting. Like I, uh, you know, it, it was kind of a more of a, a, a circumstance rather than than anything else. I, I think mm -hmm. you know the career sometimes just takes it takes itself where it almost wants to go. You're right. not all necessarily <laughs> steering every exact thing, and, and it's almost sometimes better that way. Um, I, I wasn't necessarily interested in, you know, frac sand, like 
oh my gosh, I have to do something for Axe Hand. That, that was never sort <laughs> right. of the, the case. But what really interested me about Pan Exchange, I thought was really interesting, was that, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, sort of the typical EMP. It wasn't an oil field service. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't even a, you know, a, a independent research firm like I worked for before. It re- What it really was, was, you know, sort of a, a high growth technology company that was focused on trading. And I thought, wow, you know, the fact that there's a position where you can leverage a, a petroleum engineering background and, and something like that, like that's, that's, that's pretty weird. I got to I got to check that out. And, uh, you know, coincidentally, I had a, a colleague actually. Uh, so he actually was a, not predecessor, I guess, cause it sounds like he's dead, but um, someone who, who was in my role um, previously at RS energy mm-hmm. group. Um, he's now at a Bay area startup um, embark trucks. Um, and he really kind of, um, I guess, gave me a lot of advice and a, a lot of insight in sort of the the tech world. Um, mm-hmm. You know, his company actually, interestingly enough, is doing um, large autonomous freight route testing, things like that. So they actually have like a, um, a really interesting sort of market there, obviously. And uh, yeah, I just thought it was something unique. And, you know, I, I thought I'd dare to be different and, and try something new. It's been really fun so far. So. Yeah, no, for sure. That's definitely, and, and it's good to know too, because I mean, there's definitely people when, you know, people in school right now or people coming out of school trying to figure out um, different <laughs> different ways to enter the industry and different focuses to take. Uh, that's not just the EMP or not just, you know, the contractors or the service service operators. So yeah, it's definitely interesting. It seems like I'm learning more and more um, different a- different avenues for people uh, if they're interested in, in the finance or market marketing from a, from a trade perspective. And so that's, that's definitely pretty interesting uh, background to, to go in. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, there's so much out there. And I mean, at the end of the day, especially if you're coming from something like a petroleum engineering background, I mean, at the end of the day, you're an engineer, you're a problem solver, like, you know, you you have some sort of background in technology, which is a really big thing now. You know, part of what makes engineering sort of a practical science in a way is that it's grounded in economics, which is mm-hmm. obviously useful and, you know, more of a, a business oriented role. So, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can go. And I, I think it's a shame that people could even, you know, would even think of limiting themselves because there's, <laughs> there's so much opportunity out there. Yeah, for sure. Well, and some of the stuff, I mean, we just don't hear about it very much. That's one of the reasons, you know, I'm excited to, to get you on the podcast also to cover it, <laughs> to yeah. give it, shed some light on it for sure. But, well, and I, I know in, in, in your notes, you, you also mentioned, you know, how being a resident, you know, you're, being a background of a petroleum engineer you know, gives you insight into, into some kind of reservoir <laughs> type of understanding that is useful to people who are looking for trends. And can you ex- uh, expand a little bit on that? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you have um, basically buyers and sellers on you know our company's platform that are looking to um, basically trade sand, right? So mm. um, let's say like a sand producer like High Crush or someone wants to sell um, sort of some volume of sand, let's say, you know, in the Permian to a Permian operator or to an oil field mm-hmm. service company in the in that area. So um, there's there's the data on sort of the the prices and, and the volumes that are traded that are associated with that. But also we, we kind of have, you know, a couple other layers beyond that. We actually construct indexes from that, as I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. but we also provide technical advisory with respect to, um, you know, sort of the hydraulic fracturing side of, of upstream oil and gas. Right. And and that's where, um, you know, having a petroleum engineering background comes in, in my case, like for example, um, you know, in the Permian, there was a really popular, really, really, uh, sort of well subscribed to a well spacing study that was done by Concho. Hmm. Um, and what was really interesting about that was they found that, um, they were actually getting deteriorating, um, production results from actually, um, you know, spacing their wells more tightly. And you know a lot of the a lot of the technical details in the study actually pointed to um, or suggested that perhaps that could actually be applied to the larger geologic overprint in the Permian, and that you know would greatly affect people's drilling inventory if they had to widen their well spacing, because with a limited amount of acreage, and you know only you know a certain amount of wells per section, if you um, you know lessen the wells per section, you mm-hmm. have a limited amount of sections. That means less wells to drill and mm-hmm. compre- complete and to fracture, right? And so naturally that, that ties into sort of the long-term demand planning for a frac sand producer 
you know, an oil field service company. And that's something that they're really interested in is actually getting kind of a bit of a unique vantage point, um, sort of from that different perspective that you might not always get, yeah. um, especially from something like sand, right? That seems very, no pun intended, granular. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, right, you can add as many puns as you want here. Well, maybe it's a little bit it's a pun, pun safe z- zone. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, sounds good. Well, let's let's kind of start diving in a little bit to to the details and and the intro. Kind of promised, you know, given a good overview of of sand and different types, and, and you're definitely a, the guy that has the knowledge of that. So um, lead us through the story. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess to to kind of get into you know sand, really, um, what you look at is is a couple of different key factors. Like one of them, for example, is mesh size. So there's different measures for um, mesh size. You know, some of the popular ones are, are 100 mesh, 40, 70. Those are by far the two most popular. They equate to about 90% of sort of the market share. Um, and then you have like, you know, some coarser um, mesh sizes that are, you know, like 20, 40, and 30, 50. If you're not familiar with the term mesh size, it just refers to um, sort of a mesh screen that the sand mm-hmm. is actually sort of shaken and, and settled through to actually get sort of a uniform grain size. Um, so that's definitely kind of a one sort of criteria that um, sort of the sand market is bifurcated by. Um, there's also crush strength, which is a really common um, sort of criterion in terms of assessing the uh, the frac sand. So um, crush strength is a really important factor because it sort of relates to um, obviously like fracture pressure and reservoir pressure and things mm-hmm. like that, right? Like if the if the sand granule isn't able to withstand like your fracture pressure, your reservoir pressure, what happens is that the sand will actually get crushed and fines will, you know, appear and you'll get obviously um, sort of negative impacts on on production and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, what else is there? There's also um, sort of the compatibility category. So basically um, things like, uh, you know, acidity and things like that, obviously like chemical compatibility, those are things that people look at. but You know, some of the primary things really, I guess, that that people most commonly look at are mesh size and crush strength. Um, Another thing to note is that um, there's definitely been a movement towards uh, finer uh, sort of grain sizes, if you Mm. will, of frac sand as opposed to coarser, um, because those are more compatible with slick water completion designs as opposed to gel fracs. And what that really has to do is the settlement velocity. So if you imagine like a very fine piece of sand floating um, you know, through like a like a stream or something, let's say, versus something coarser, right? Um, you know, a finer a finer grain of sand will float much more easily, and it would, you know, obviously um, settle to the bottom at a ver- like a ver- almost mm-hmm. a standstill, right? Whereas like a coarser grain might sink unless there's a lot more um, sort of fluid velocity there. So, um, in order to prevent uh, you know, grains from settling out, um, you know, naturally you'd have sort of coarser grains that would be, um, you know, more compatible with a more viscous frac fluid, like a, like a linear or a cross link polymer gel, as opposed to a slick water frac with, you know, a friction reducing chemical. Right. Um, so that, that's kind of basically kind of the, I guess a bit of a detail on, on some of the product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can definitely I'll, I'll add a few notes in there too for someone who who is new to <laughs> frac sand or anything. So I mean, definitely like so as, as you've already alluded to, Alex, like the the mesh size being basically the the size of the grain. It's kind of counterintuitive because the larger number of the mesh is the smaller the grain. So <laughs> if anybody yeah, hears, it's a very weird system, <laughs> and, and honestly, the, the best bet is to just read through the the API, which is American Petroleum Institute, mm-hmm. like sort of definitions of these things and really just kind yeah. of get your head around it because it, it definitely it definitely takes it to a, t- a few times it's not the most intuitive thing yeah but, yeah um at the end of the day yeah it, it's just really there is you know four common mesh sizes and really you know the most common 200 mesh and 4070 tend to be more fine i guess is, is the way to kind of put it mm. simply yeah, definitely good numbers for anybody to <laughs> have on the top of their their tongue. If you know if they're talking to anybody about frac sand, definitely like you said, uh, among the most common for sure. And then um, we were talking about what the 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 crush strength. Obviously, the, the purpose of it is to keep the formation propped open. So if it doesn't, if it's not going to hold it, then you know. So that's why you're talking about you know with the crush 
with the uh, yeah crush strength being such a important factor. And then um, one thing I wanted to ask you about too was with the with the, the slick water versus like you're talking about like the gels or, or hybrid fracks. Uh, yep. Is that mostly our operators pretty primarily switching more to slick water fracks now because of, of cost? Is it, is it pretty much just emerging now that that slick water costs less or is it, do you know if it's more uh, well results driven or, or, or what? Um, I mean, I, I think it's a function of both. I mean, I, I definitely feel like there's been um, sort of a push towards well results just in terms of um, sort of the results of finer sand actually mm -hmm. um, creating longer fractures rather than wider and actually penetrating deeper into, you know, some of these, some of these sh uh, unconventional shales. Right. So I think that's, that's definitely kind of physically what's driving kind of the increases in production, okay. um, the best of my understanding. So I, I think it might be, um, sort of more well result driven. Um, at the same time too, when you look at something like, um, a gel, a gel frack versus a, a slick water frack, what's interesting is that, um, naturally, you know, a slick water frack with friction reducing chemical mm -hmm. is less viscous, obviously. Right. Um, but what's interesting about that is how that translates to the pressure pumping equipment at surface, because if you have like a less viscous, more easily flowing fluid, it requires less horsepower to pump it. And that translates into how much horsepower you need and how much fuel you consume. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. <laughs> that's why I, I allude to the fact that it's kind of both. Um, but at the end of the day, regardless of whether it is or whether it's a combo, um, when, when you see sort of a transition to 90%, you know, finer mesh size frac sand that that's really compatible with either the slick water or these hybrid um, sort of frac designs, um, I, th I think that's very telling of the fact that, um, you know, either way, there's definitely sort of an increase in sort of the incremental net present value as a result mm -hmm. of kind of moving in that direction. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And ha have you seen uh, much of a trend? So you said uh, we're trending more towards the smaller uh, grain size, larger mesh size. Have you seen it extend much or demand pick up for anything above a hundred mesh? Because hundred seems to kind of be the, the standard, smallest standard that that's used very widely across the industry. But I know there's also like uh, micro mesh, which what most people would probably consider above a hundred mesh or above right. a 200, 200 or above, but <laughs> right. Currently. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like just based on like the, you know, volumes we're seeing in the market, like really heavily dominated hundred mesh and 40, 70 at this point, okay. not to say that, you know, things can change. I mean, obviously, you know, years ago, you know, it was very much sort of gel frack dominated and, mm. you know, yeah. ports, you know, no one would have thought of using, <laughs> you know, fine, fine, small, yeah. fine sand, right. As opposed to like coarser sand. So, like I say, like things change all the time. Um, and, and people are always trying things new. Um, it was interesting. I was at a conference a few years ago. Um, and actually Doug Suttles, like the CEO of Incana, which is now Oventive, um, was speaking in, in like this panel and it was, they were discussing sort of like data and, and technology and, and digitization, yeah. how it relates to, um, you know, oil and gas. And, you know, one of the things he was saying they were doing at Oventive and or previously in Canada was that, you know, they want to try and fail faster, right? <laughs> so they, they want to try things in and they want to fail and learn from them. Yeah. Right. So I, I think it's a very good thing that people are trying like either coarser or finer or, you know, what happens if we do this? Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I, I think that's always a positive thing and people are always sort of trying to push the envelope in terms of, you know, what can be done because there's so many different uh, angles to explore. Yeah. It'll, it'll be interesting too, is companies experiment more with a larger mesh size that, like you said, it transports them easier, but I've also heard of that being uh, in a little bit of a, a bad way in the sense that it goes a little too far and then you get a little bit uh, worse frack hits. <laughs> and then right. it's not just big grains that can kind of get caught and doorly into the well, but it's small, fine grains that'll just tear up <laughs> everything yeah, <laughs> down here, yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so that'll be interesting to, to keep an eye on. But uh, and you said, so most of them, and in terms of, so I know, what Northern white sand was kind of like the, the hot ticket item at the beginning, you know, when all the hydraulic fracturing really, really took off large scale with the shales and, and now is it more regionally sourced, right? Yeah. So, so to give a bit of a history, I guess, for someone who's, who's kind of new. So basically like a lot of the, uh, the frac sand supply was, um, you know, historically it was produced in, in the Northern Midwest 
uh, United States of places like Minnesota, Wisconsin, mm-hmm. um, you know, you know, places in, in that sort of region of the United States. And, you know, then, then what happened was, um, people saw sort of the, basically the cost breakdown of the sand and they saw that, you know, so much of the actual cash cost of actually getting the cost to the well site, um, was so unevenly distributed with respect to um, the sta- the cost of the standalone product versus the cost mm. of actually um, transporting the product to where they needed it to be. Um, so, I mean, such a large portion of that was actually freight. And so what happened then is people started exploring new options, right? As we were talking about earlier, people are always exploring new mm. options to, you know, try and add value to their bottom line. And so um, that's really what spurred the emergence of um, sort of regional supply, which is basically, um, you know, supply that's sourced in Basin. So for in the Permian, for example, there's actually frac sand mines that actually produce uh, frac sand locally. And, and it's a lot more proximal, obviously, than mm-hmm. Illinois or Wisconsin right. <laughs> or something like that. It's several, several states away. Um, so naturally, the, the cost of freight is substantially lower and it presents, you know, lower input costs. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, the, you know, there is sort of differences in quality of sand depending on where it's sourced from. Um, but it's it's hard to, I guess, argue against, you know, lower costs. And um, they've had mm-hmm. results that in terms of the difference in production and the difference of cost, um, you know, really uh, in regional in-basin supply has really started to dominate market share in certain certain regions like the Permian, the Eagle Ford. Um, you know, to name two really prominent ones where there's been just a substantial um, shift in, in market share there. Um, and, you know, it, it's really kind of interesting because of how prices have responded to, obviously, in, in both of those markets. I mean, because, you know, the the shift to the, the Permian sand, you know, so many players entered and, you know, the price was, you know, <laughs> obviously went down, you know, the price of yeah. Northern White once they had all these competitors that were much more local and, and things like that you know, that obviously had an effect on price. So it's, it's quite interesting to see how the market has changed because it's actually been, you know, over the past few years, it's actually been quite volatile. So. <laughs> I, I have to imagine that anything <laughs> commodity wise that's even associated with oil market is going to be <laughs> like that just because of our, our nature and uh, what you were talking about, like them, you know, prices being high and then them spooling up. I mean, just like the shale plays all over. So <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's it's quite interesting, too, because, mm-hmm. you know, oil obviously has a very organized medium exchange, you know, like crops like corn and wheat and soybeans obviously have like an organized medium of exchange where you can trade them and trade futures on them. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, like until until pan exchange came into the game, there wasn't really an organized medium of exchange where, you know, there was sort of a, a <laughs> regularly populated like index price for frac sand in different areas or you know, a centralized location where people could buy and sell or, um, you know, to make sure that there were actually vetted, you know, market participants on the platform, right? So, um, you know, that that's kind of interesting, too, because it's such a large market. Like, um, you know, I read a report from, like, Rystad Energy, for example, and they pinned, you know, U.S. frac sand demand at 125 million short tons um, of demand in, in the U.S. lower 48 in 2019. So to basically a, sh- a short ton is 2000 pounds of sand. So that that's actually like 2 billion pounds of sand and there was no organized medium of exchange and the prices are going everywhere. <laughs> so you can imagine it, there's quite a bit of pandemonium there and it's quite interesting like it was it was quite an interesting opportunity for for pan exchange because you you know what I'm saying like there, yeah, there was nobody's... so much going on like and and people to this day really in a lot of ways they don't view it as a as a commodity, which is, is kind of a shame because I think, you know, <laughs> when you're managing your supply chain, it's, it's, it's a useful tool to be able to have that kind of flexibility. Like if you wanted to hedge or if you wanted to price against an index or lock in a price or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you're buying that much product and you know, it's such a substantial input cost, um, since mm-hmm. fracking is, you know, the biggest input cost, you know, in upstream oil and gas. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just think that's a really kind of interesting opportunity that people, can take advantage of mm-hmm. so is it is it only traded on on, on y'all's site like, or is there another market it's it's traded or like who would so i guess and maybe i'm jumping ahead too but you know we're talking about kind of the logistics of it uh, people trading it like you're talking about what 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 is that what is, where does that take place is it actually on your guys platform or 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, a lot of it is done mm-hmm. off-platform. Like, we obviously, you know, weren't around, like, at the beginning of the shale boom. I mean, we originally formed, like, the exchange to actually encompass um, Braxand as a commodity, like, late 2017. Um, so, naturally, like, the shale boom had already kind of started, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so, naturally, the, there was so much sort of off-market um, sort of commerce going on that uh, really what what we were trying to do is tr- try to actually introduce people to sort of an easier way to actually transact something that was a little bit more seamless and something that gave them a little bit more liquidity, flexibility, transparency, things like that. And so it, it's been interesting because we're, as far as we know, the only organized medium of exchange for this. Um, but at the same time too, I imagine that, um, you know, because of the technology we have, the, the scalability that we have in terms of, some of these other commodities that are a little mm-hmm. bit more low key. We don't just trade frac sand. Um, you know, some of the larger exchanges might be interested in, um, you know, sort of data sharing partnerships or even mm-hmm. sort of some sort of uh, like partnership in, in that regard. So it's kind of where we're at. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I have one question for you in terms of we're talking about the Northern White versus the the End Basin sand and yep. one of the. I kind of remember the kind of being on the edge of this transition kind of when I started entering <laughs> the industry, um, it, as you kind of alluded to, you know, people had a concern about the quality, that the quality would be different with like Northern white was just kind of the premium, right? It's like the, the Lexus or the Cadillac. What, what in terms of quality, like what, what would they look for or what would be off about uh, in basin sand? Is it just kind of like, how consistent like the 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 grain is shaped i mean like what quality wise what would people be looking for um for, for sand so i mean the biggest thing is, is really is crush strength um mm-hmm. and, and that relates to production of fines and sort of the um sort of sort of basically the production quality that's associated with the sand i think that's really the biggest thing um but also like by by definition, I mean, in ter- if you're actually going to market something as 100 mesh, mm-hmm. there has to be a certain um, like percentage of your sand volume that actually falls through that mesh and is stopped by like a, a different mesh below it. Um, so, so really, um, it, it's not sort of uniformity of the, the sand size. Um, sphericity tends to be quite similar. And, and really, some of those um, sort of other parameters really tend to be quite similar. But I, I think really the quality stems from crush strength. Um, that said though, again, like it's, it's not sort of always about um, sort of quality, right? It's, it's also about sort of at the end of the day, how it affects the incremental mm-hmm. net present value of the well you're actually completing. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and people, you know, definitely kind of need to think a bit larger picture. Um, we have seen uh, sort of differing results in terms of different sizes of sand. So for example, right now like northern white sand that actually is still like freighted down to the permian for example Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing a lot more of like as a percentage of 40 70 as opposed to 100 mesh so um you're we're definitely seeing more pushback on the quality as you go into the coarser grain sizes as opposed to the finer ones which is kind of interesting so okay that's kind of a trend we've been seeing yeah no that's interesting and do you know if um you know that I guess that the mine or wherever the the sand is extracted from the earth at, uh, whether it's surface or, or whatever, but um, whenever do they control the the grain size? I'm assuming that's not natural, right? They would crush it to a particular mesh. Uh, do you have any idea on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I obviously like haven't worked at at a frac sand mine, but yeah, obviously they uh, based on on sort of the geology they have, they have certain um, specs that allow them to crush it into certain sizes. Um, and, and also basically, um, it, it's not only sort of the capability of the geology, but it's also mm. sort of the positioning of the mine and the facility that, that really determines sort of the product that they're going to be selling. So for example, like if you are proximal to a class one railroad, um, or if you're proximal to, you know, a lot of well sites that are, you know, really predominantly using a hundred mesh or really predominantly using 4070, then you're going to scale your operation in such a way that you know, maybe you only have certain mesh sizes or maybe you have mm-hmm. sort of the full suite of mesh sizes. So, I mean, there's there's definitely a bunch of factors there. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, well, I appreciate the 
definitely a pretty good intro on on Fraxan, and we can kind of move into talking a little bit more about you know how the how the commodities and how it's actually traded. I'm definitely interested to learn a little bit more about the the ins and outs. And I mean, when we did we've done uh, an episode or two on uh, oil commodity trading. I'm sure this is different, so I'm excited to to learn a little bit more about it. But I guess kind of uh, where would you start in terms of discussing the basics on that? Yeah. So I mean. Yeah, like I said, like you guys are oil field basics. So I mean, yeah. you know, I guess there's always some some basic things, right? So I mean, for trading, you know, very, you know, back to basics, very sort of ground level. You always you you need a market, right? So a market is composed of counterparts, which is just a fancy way of saying buyers and sellers, right? For every mm-hmm. buyer, there's a seller that they're counterparts. They you know they're yin to the yang, right? <laughs> Um, and really, so there's two types of traders that buy and sell commodities. There's hedgers and there's speculators. So a hedger actually is geared to actually take the physical delivery of a commodity. So for example, um, a hedger would be um, like a, a refinery, right? Like they're actually geared to actually, you know, actually get oil physically delivered to their location mm-hmm. so they can refine it, right? And, you know, the net seller in that case would be the oil company that's producing it, right? So they want to ensure that they're getting the best price for their uh, delivery of their oil. Um, and there's also speculators in the market which um, don't actually want delivery of the physical product. So what they do is they buy offsetting contracts. So they'll have a contract that says, I want to buy you know, crude oil at you know several months into the future, but before that contract expires and the oil shows up to their office location or even to their, to their house, um, depending if they're an independent trader or not, Um, they'll actually also purchase a contract to sell the oil before the contract expires. So they're never actually um, taking physical delivery of the product. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the advantage of that is that it provides liquidity into the market. Um, So basically what it means is that it better ensures that there's a contract to actually buy or sell if or when you actually want to is another way to put that. So, um, it it just ensures that you can you can get out or you can sell something if if you have to. So okay, and that's what you mean um, by they also, liquidity. They also play a, a very important role, even though they're not actually actually moving the product around. Gotcha. Um, and then yeah, so um, a few other terms I guess you can learn about too. Uh, you know, a long position is basically someone who is is wanting to buy, and a short position is someone who wants to sell. Um, so naturally, a speculator like I was alluding to before, for every long, they want to have a short that offsets that contract so they're not having, you know, oil tankers showing up at their house or their front door or right. things like that. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, I guess another thing too is like options, right? Like put options, call options are some really, you know, important terms. Um, you know, whether it's oil or gas or, or fraxan, really a lot of exchanges in trading sort of um, is grounded in sort of the same fundamental concepts regarding regardless of whatever commodity it is and I think they're really really important to learn especially in oil and gas because mm. oil and oil is actually the largest uh, sort of commodity market in the world it's the largest global trade right like and I think I, I think it's something a lot of engineers take for granted like I it's a it's amazing that you know um, you could go into engineering and not learn something about trading because particularly petroleum because I yeah. Mean, it's it's such a big thing and and really there's there's natural gas that that comes out of the well um you know especially in in the permian right there's all this associated gas and and even just pure natural gas plays and then you have sand too which is an input cost that even you know people are looking at you know potentially hedging and and locking in prices and Mm -hmm. and you know having that financial flexibility so it's yeah it's it's, it's, it's interesting too how how similar like what how you're explaining it and how it is to oil itself just from the discussions I've had with uh, Michael Tanner on <laughs> previous yeah. episodes on, on the podcast when he was kind of talking about, you know, the stays and puts and, <laughs> and the, the futures market and all that kind of stuff. And there's definitely a lot of uh, crossover and, and uh, definitely crazy that we don't learn about it in school, you know, even myself being a, a petroleum engineering background, I'm trying to learn about it now. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, we're working to get something, a resource up on, on our site also, um, on, right. on this topic of trading to, to help out or a couple of different resources are kind of in the works, but uh, I definitely agree with you on that one. Yeah. And, and, you know, one, one kind of shout out to Montana tech too is, is, you know, something is there was actually like a mandatory class we had to take and it was actually like a petroleum economic evaluation course. And, 
um, it was pretty interesting. Um, you know, the, uh, um, the, the course actually covered things like futures and, and some of these kind of concepts and, and things like that. So that was, I found that that was like actually a really, really helpful. Yeah, no, it's, definitely. It's Kudos very, to Montana great. tech. <laughs> yeah. Right. There you go. One point for you guys. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. We had, we had an economics course at uh, Marriott too. We didn't really go into, into trading. <laughs> so yeah. definitely would have been beneficial. You know, I think in kind of, as we alluded to on the, at the beginning of the episode, you know, if, if that was more prevalent, uh, I think you'd have more petroleum engineers coming out seeking to, to get into that, this side of the industry. Cause honestly, there's, there's a lot of, um, students that have a mind to, to finance and have a mind for that marketing and, and that kind of work. And uh, they'd probably definitely be more interested if they knew more about it. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And it, you know, particularly with petroleum engineering, because it is so commodity driven and it's so trade driven and it's so yeah. market driven. I mean, I think it's, it's actually less of an unconventional career path than people would think. Right. I think people would really be surprised how many engineers or especially engineers with MBAs that work at, you know, investment mm-hmm. banks or, or things like that, or in, in consulting roles um, and such. Um, so it, it's actually really opened my eyes too. Yeah, no, for sure. I guess kind of, you know, on the, as we were talking about, you know, with trading and you, you mentioned advantageous for, for ref, refineries to, you know, hedge oil, you know, just like um, operators to, to hedge sand as a commodity. I'm definitely a little bit curious about how how you would hedge sand, and how you know if you how that differs from any other types of hedging and other commodities like oil or, or what you got for us. Yeah, so I mean, there, there's different ways to hedge. Um, you know, so for for example, um, it really depends what you're trying to do. Um, typically, for oil, a lot of the hedges are are three way collars, um, which is kind of interesting, and, and there's a lot more complexity to it. I think for something like sand, because it's a lot smaller market, I think you might see a lot more simple hedges. In in oil, what's interesting was that I was reading this report. It was put on by, um, I believe it was Bank of America, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I could be wrong on that, though. Um, but what was interesting was they were saying that 43% of volumes were hedged for crude oil for like 2020, like oh, wow. as of the end of last year, yeah. which crazy right because that leaves a lot on the table you know mm-hmm. and you know it's very common is sort of the um the three-way collar style of hedging um so so basically what that is is you're betting that um you know oil could go lower but you're trying to lock in a, a certain price but you're betting that it won't go lower than a certain point right so so basically what it means is if you're trying to hedge oil at 50 dollars and you're trying to protect yourself in terms of downside insurance um, rather than going down to zero or even negative, which we've seen it's gone to, you know, you're only protecting yourself down to 40, right? Or, or whatever price you set okay. because the insurance is cheaper, right? So it, it's kind of an interesting style of hedging. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's interesting and in, particularly in crude oil, I think that, you know, even though like hedging might become more costly in the future, I think, you know, in order to um, sort of keep investors on board in terms of, you know, not only like profitability from a profitability standpoint, but also a, a certainty standpoint. Mm-hmm. Investors tend to really like certainty, um, and they tend to get scared away when markets are very volatile. And, and often, get, you know, often as we see in oil and gas, as we've seen, so um, I think people are going to be more aggressive despite the cost. Um, so I think that's that's something that we're going to see on the oil side. Um, mm-hmm. And I think you know, even looking towards things like sand, even if it is like more of a simple hedge. I think the more sort of certainty you can have regarding sort of your, not only your revenue stream, but your cost stream, I think that's a really prospect, you know, attractive prospect, not only for the oil company, but, you know, for the, for the person or the, the syndicate or the, the company that is really financing them. Mm-hmm. Have, have you seen, uh, I, I guess what, you know, what trends have you seen on the hedging side w- with sand overall right now with, with investors and kind of all everything that you just, just mentioned, have you seen any big trends to more and more people hedging? Because I know you previously mentioned, you know, how up and down it was and that it ultimately would scare away investors. So um, overall, well, how is that going? Yeah. So so on the sand side, which in, what's interesting is there's definitely a bit of a language gap, um, you know, because like because like sand wasn't originally viewed as a commodity for whatever reason. Um, and because like obviously, you know, due to the 
um, more recent, I guess, sort of dawn of unconventional shale. It's it's not been around as long as corn, mm-hmm. right? So um, it's a bit of a newer thing, and, and people just thought of it as sort of a cost center more than anything. And so um, really it's been interesting because we've seen more and more interaction with people who are traditionally supply chain managers that are really sort of having more of a stringent eye for, hey, like, you know, there is a bit more flexibility here. There is a way that, um, you know, I could, you know, mm-hmm. not only be more profitable or, you know, protect myself, but but actually do it a bit more seamlessly. So I, I think that's kind of interesting. I think when times are volatile too, I think people are a little bit, a little bit hesitant, obviously, to do something new. Um, so I think that's that's something we face, and that's a struggle we face as mm-hmm. um, sort of in, in in our neck of the woods, industry wise. But um, I, th- I think that page is kind of definitely turning, and I think that you know, oil and gas, by and large, in terms of technology, um, in in terms of things like that, it's so data rich and it's so ripe for opportunity on that front. And historically, it has been, you know, kind of slow to adapt. But I think that that's you know. It's nice to see that that's starting to change, and I think that, you know, where I'm standing, it's it's no different. I think it's really kind of starting to take off a little bit. Mm-hmm. In terms of hedging styles, so you mentioned you know a lot of oil being hedged with a three way collar. Do you see any particular common styles for for hedging of of frac sand? Yeah, like I was mentioning, they're they're you know much more simple contracts. A lot of them okay. are you know very simple spot contracts that we're seeing. Um, we do see some sort of long-term contracts, but um, because of the price volatility, as I mentioned, you know, the changes in market share, I think people, you know, naturally, you know, kind of got burned by some of these long-term contracts as a result. And so naturally they've kind of trended a little bit more toward the spot market. Um, so, and, and prices definitely have been a bit more, um, I don't know, I, I, I guess like basically the, the trends have allowed, um, more opportunities in terms of the spots rather than sort of these long-term contracts. So do you, on, on your platform, like do you guys actually actively participate with, with the hedges or I guess, how does your, your platform then contribute to w- w- all this that we've just discussed? Yeah. So to be clear, like we are actually just an exchange, like we don't actually do any trading ourselves. Mm-hmm. Like that would obviously create a, a conflict of interest, right? Because we could manipulate the market. <laughs> so yeah, so we do, we do not do that. So, um, <laughs> So our, our platform, what makes it kind of cool is it's institutional grade. So something like some of these big exchanges like, you know, CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, for example, you know, the classic trading floor when everyone's, you know, shuffling paper around and yelling mm-hmm. at each other and constantly on the phone, like that kind of thing. Um, so we, we have all the same sort of capabilities in terms of the, the technology and the, the, uh, the online marketplace, if you will, that um, something like that has. But what makes our platform kind of unique is it was actually – um, sort of proprietary tech that was actually patented by our, our company's uh, CEO and founder. Um, and, and what's kind of interesting about some of the capabilities, to name a few, one is the negotiation. So basically we have um, what's called sort of the, uh, the the price negotiation feature, which basically say, you know, I'm going to sell a product for $15 a ton, um, but I would go as – or let me phrase this a different way. I want to buy a product for $15 a ton, but I would go as high as $20 a ton. A bro- if you're going through a broker that's trying to you know, match you up with a, someone selling that, they hear 20 because they know that they can get a cut. They don't even hear 15. How high will this person go, right? Whereas on, on our platform, we have a hidden price tolerance. So in other words, if, if someone is selling for 17 you know, you'd be able to buy at 17 because that's within the range of your, your price tolerance that's hidden from the counterpart, like the seller, right? Um, and so there's no sort of skewing of, of market prices by a broker that's trying to get a cut. Um, so that's kind of one of the cooler features of our, our platform. And then also sort of the flexibility in terms of actually seeing prices like live in real time and, and actually managing your counterparts in terms of, you know, how much trading exposure you have to them you know, managing, you know, who you actually want to trade with or, or don't want to trade with based on, you know, how you want to vet them. Like, for example, like a financial statement, like maybe they're not credit worthy or something like that. But, you know, just as an example, there's there's quite a bit of, of flexibility on the platform and it's really scalable to a bunch of, of different commodities that are kind of, as I said earlier, like in their budding stages that 
is sort of our market. Okay, you gotcha. Know, I, I really doubt we're going to compete with the, the crude oil trading capabilities. <laughs> some of these gotcha. market exchanges at this point. So, <laughs> but you, but you guys you guys uh, help with the trading of other things too, right? You said hemp. I think last time we talked. And yeah, hemp is definitely you know probably our our biggest uh, sort of market for us. It, it was pretty interesting because it came, became sort of federally legal um, in <laughs> December 2018 and. Um, yeah, it's, it's been kind of a really fascinating market as well. Um, I don't cover that market, but we have um, people who are kind of on that team as well. And um, it's been really interesting because, um, you know, you see so many products with it, you know, like, for example, like hemp shampoo and, <laughs> and things like that, like even in Walmart now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's been really kind of a, a fascinating um, journey for them, I think. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very rare that you actually have a new commodity right like it's not like commodities just sort of drop out of space right it's not like right. corn was just invented <laughs> like five years ago or something right. you know what i mean like corn's been around a while like they're <laughs> you know what i mean they're fairly original so yeah um it, it's pretty neat to you know have a, a platform that's involved in something like that too and it's very cool to learn from people that have you know drastically different backgrounds um from my note from my own right like um for example you know uh you know, a colleague of mine on, on the hemp team, for example, came from like a really strong, like fertilizer trading background down in Florida. Um, so that was pretty interesting because he had a, you know, a lot of the, the trading terms really down pat and mm. um, that helped me kind of bridge some of the gap that, that I had when I came into the role that I did right now. So, um, like I say that, you know, no matter how far apart you are, you can learn from someone. And, and sometimes you learn the most from people that are furthest away from where you came from so. yeah no that's interesting there's, I've done, there's all these things i didn't realize was was traded as a commodity now fertilizer so <laughs> yeah definitely interesting but uh one thing i definitely like to to hit on a little bit more um before we wrap up uh, we, we've touched on it a little bit throughout the podcast but just the idea of you know someone and, and it's, i'm sure it's even more relevant now uh with the industry uh where it is but anybody somebody who's looking to step outside of a little bit of what, what would be viewed conventional right so anything you know with the banking or trading consulting uh you know investment you know firms and uh i guess what advice or, or, or pro tips <laughs> would you have for anybody who's looking to to kind of uh, expand their their horizons Right. So, so first of all, I, I would say, you know, it's not as unconventional as you think, like a lot mm -hmm. of engineers are actually interested in this and actually do this. Um, so one of the big things, like for me, like, even though like my role, um, at the end of the day is, is engineering dominated, like that's really sort of the dominant, you know, feature of my job. Um, but I've definitely been around sort of, um, capital markets and, and trading. Um, my previous role, I would say would have been a more finance oriented role, if anything, mm -hmm. rather than engineering, although, I leverage an engineering background. So um, there's definitely differing levels of exposure there in terms of how far you want to go down that path. Um, but definitely, you know, kind of at least steering yourself that way, you know, getting hands on experience is so important. Like, I mean, I, you know, uh, with a colleague of mine, Thor, um, Thor <laughs> Larson, um, you know, we went to Montana Tech together and we started this sort of side club through. SPE and mm -hmm. um, we actually got sponsored by like industry and and also through faculty to actually go to Boston and and network at Harvard Business School of all places and oh wow no we we were you know a total bunch of phonies or whatever but it was <laughs> it was really quite interesting just to see how many of the, the people competing at these like really high level sort of like case competitions that were grounded in finance and technology and, and these kind of cases um, were actually from an engineering background and just meeting people from all over the world right it was it was really quite interesting and even getting a club off the ground or getting you know uh mm -hmm. an e-learning business off the ground right that's <laughs> that's hands-on um so that's a really good thing you know is hands-on experience networking with different people is huge um you know you hear from these people right all the new tools that are coming out and, and the best way to hear about them is to be in communication with the people who are actually using them mm -hmm. i think that's a, a really important thing um, I would say for particularly for jobs in, in research, equity research, trading, investment banking, consulting, grades are definitely important um, just because it is so competitive in terms of getting in, especially out of school. Um, and they can kind of cherry pick from, you know, sort of a, a select group, right? Like they are not everything, but you have to meet, you know, a certain threshold that mm -hmm. is, you know, fairly high. Um, so that's definitely important. You don't want to be sort of self-limiting in any way. Um, you know, and, and you can always tell your story. I mean, like, mm -hmm. you know, don't get discouraged if you had a bad first year, you can always sort right. of frame that, right. You can always sort of shape that. 
Um, and also this is, this is a big one. And I think this is probably the most common uh, sort of way that people have gone wrong is, is telling a coherent narrative on your resume. So for example, like if you have a, if you're jumping from an engineering background, like maybe you work as like a drilling engineer or something, mm -hmm. you know, like a lot of people will say, you know, I'm applying for a job in oil and gas investment banking. And I have this drilling engineer role, like as my previous role on a resume, like maybe I, you know, took a, like a finance course or something online or something like that. But their, their drilling engineering role talks about, you know, all these drill bits, all these pumps, all this like really technical jargon, but really they're not talking dollars and cents. Like they're not, mm -hmm. you know, speaking the same language. And, and so from a recruitment standpoint, they don't see the coherent narrative. Like it makes sense that this person has been led here. Mm -hmm. Like they're really looking for someone whose logical next step is that role. You know, they don't, there's, there shouldn't be any question there. So I think that's a really important thing, like in terms of speaking their language, like for example, you know, understanding sort of, um, sort of the technical aspects of, of oil and gas, like understanding, you know, how, you know, boots on the ground, Intel and, and operational knowledge relays into, um, you know, kind of asset value and how asset value um, relays into investment banking, like actually having sort of the full spectrum sort of picture to bring to the table. In addition to the fact that, hey, you know, I have some financial background, like I know how to run a discounted cash flow model, like I know how to, you know, mm -hmm. run like a comparable model, a comparable transaction model, right? Like, I know how to do a sum of the parts model, like, things like that like in terms of bridging the gap i think is is really really important and, and something people shouldn't you know sort of um sort of take lightly i think like a well-written resume is is a powerful tool mm -hmm. so. so not using your the same resume for every single opportunity <laughs> that, that's another thing too not only to, yeah. like not having the same resume for everything but be interesting mm -hmm. like honestly like it's amazing how much interesting stuff people do like i think you know, oil field basics, like I'm, I'm not just, you know, pumping your tires here, but I think like having an e-learning platform and just starting that from the ground up is just incredibly interesting. <laughs> and I think people have really incredibly interesting things like that they did on their mm -hmm. internships and things like that, that they don't mention on their resume. They just list their tasks or, you know, like getting involved on campus or, or doing something like volunteer related or or something like that, or mm. taking a course that's maybe a little bit different that just interests you. Like, yeah, make you know, make your resume such that it would actually jump off the page to someone. Like, just yeah. like, like from an engineering point, from a uh, standpoint, from a number standpoint, think about how many resumes are in the pile, mm -hmm. and then think about okay, if my resume isn't very interesting, what are my chances compared to if my resume is really interesting? Yeah. Even if I don't have the best grades, you know. Right. You and it's not know. it's not just to do the story of every little thing you've done, um, but right. it's it's good to, to showcase what you're actually interested in. And, and I mean, <laughs> going through this uh, the intern intern re recruitment process was definitely um, eye opening for me in terms of just seeing it from the other side. Um, of, yeah. I guess a recruiter, <laughs> and yeah. uh, that really means a lot to actually uh, be able to say, "Well, this this person's it's very easy to tell they're interested in this," and and like what you're talking about. Um, this needs to be, uh, you know, whatever they're going for, whether it's in you know, the investment banking position or whatever, um, that their, their resume is, is written to, to that. Right, right, exactly. And, uh, you know, the other thing is, is like, you know, like just don't discount an experience. Like, I, I think people really tend to sell themselves short. And I, I think it's, it's a shame, you know, like, uh, you know, if you went in some like robotics competition or if you went right. in some, like that's really cool. Like people want to hear about that. Yeah, yeah. And one of the, one of the a good common interview question. You know, tell me something not on your resume, <laughs> and yeah, that, uh, that's yeah. where you can bring those up if you don't have them on your resume. But you know, if you can, definitely fit it. Uh, definitely uh, some good stuff right. to to include. Right. But yeah. Well, I guess you know. Overall, I mean, I know you also had some some notes down here too for anybody who's just starting out in the industry, um, whether you know, into, into this type of the, the sector of the industry or, or what, I guess, what advice you would have for them? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, being cross-trained, like having some business skill is definitely sort of really mm -hmm. advantageous as you know, I alluded to earlier, but you know, engineering at the end of the day, whether it's petroleum or otherwise is a practical science. So that naturally means it's grounded in not only physical reality, but also an economic one. 
right? Like your, your engineering products actually have to make economic sense. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how efficient something is. If you know, you're actually making less money by making it slightly more efficient. Right. You know I mean? <laughs> so that's, that's definitely kind of an important contextual thing that I think people need, um, in terms of, you know, business needs and in terms of making sure that you're creating the most value and, and, and people want to employ you. Right. Um, so it's been definitely advantageous for me having that background, but I'm definitely biased. But I think sort of the larger takeaway from that is actually having some hands-on experience and, and really getting into something that you like and really um, bringing a lot of different things to the table. Like, um, you know, just an example, a colleague of mine, you know, from school, you know, he started like a similar kind of approach, same base concept but something different. It was, you know, a club where people would actually go out to the rig site and actually you know, interact with people on the rig floor, like the, the trades people, the, the, the field engineers and everything, mm -hmm. and, and actually get to, you know, be acquainted with, you know, what's going on at, at site, right? Um, for somebody who wanted to be a drilling engineer or, you know, someone who wanted to have more of an operational understanding of, like, how things work, right? So very different from on a computer screen versus, you know, in the field, right, as, as you probably know. And, um, you know, I, I just think that... Um, you know, kind of that hands-on experience and, and learning sort of different pieces around you, whether it's business, mm -hmm. whether it's trades, whether it's tech, whether it's whatever. I mean, it's it's all valuable because it helps you integrate better with the pieces around you. And and don't really be, like, afraid to try anything different. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I've tried a lot of stuff that would be considered, like, super weird or different. But, I mean, <laughs> it, it's it, Honestly, the weirdest stuff I've tried has probably been the most helpful for me so far. So... I definitely well, it make, would. Yeah, it makes makes you stand out. It makes you unique. Yeah, you're not just you're just not another resume in the pile. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, you never know how it's going to turn out, but it's it's just another tool that ex you know at your disposal that you could use someday. And yeah, I mean, it's hard to go wrong when you're you're pursuing something that you're interested in. You think, yeah, for sure. You know, you're good at so. And and and, and I guess my, my last little con concluding mar remark on on this end is that. Uh, w what you're actually passionate about will show through in the interview. <laughs> um, and, and it's, it's a good thing if it does. And if you have passion for, you know, what you're going after, um, but you know, if, if your priorities are a little skewed, if you're not actually passionate about it, if you're in it for the wrong reasons, that'll also show too. So like you're saying, you know, follow, follow your interests. Um, uh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I think so. Follow your interests, you know, and, and also follow, um, something that, you know, you think you'd, have an inclination for and, and something mm -hmm. you could be good at right i, th I think it's kind of a combo yeah but, uh, for sure. yeah definitely, definitely. yeah <laughs> well that's about our, our time for the episode i'm glad we got to to fit all that in definitely had a, a full schedule here and it was pretty insightful i definitely got to uh, hopefully it was a good it was a good first resource for anybody who's you know wondering about uh, how sand is, is traded and also some of the, the basic characteristics of it so again thank you so much for for taking the time to to be on the show i appreciate that and uh, if anybody is interested in, in reaching out to alex i'll include his linkedin link in the, the show notes well, yeah, thanks for having me, Derek. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, be sure to catch us in the next episode and leave us a review. Thanks, everyone. Take care.